this um, is the cover of our new book for our book study. It's called Miracles on Maple Hill. It's written by Virginia Sorensen. This is the inside book jacket uh, or inside book cover. Um, it's, it, this book is illustrated by Beth and Joe Crush. It is a scholastic publication. And this gives you um, an idea of you know, kind of what this book is going to be about. You see um, a child who's dressed not in modern day clothing. So it tells you that the time period of this is going to be set somewhat in the past. Uh, you see some uh, buildings here, a uh, lot of nature, uh, hills, but the most important thing is it's cold. You see snow. All right, the book was originally um, published in 1956 by Virginia Sorensen, so that gives you a time frame of when this book would have been published. It would have, it's written about the same time frame as um, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, uh, Bud, Not Buddy, um, uh, One Hot Summer, so several other books that we may have read um, were written about this same time frame. This is also the dedication page. It's dedicated to those who helped Harvey Kreitz and Waldo Bates and Royce Mallory and remembering Uncle Chris. This is your table of contents. There are 14 chapters. We're going to do one chapter a day. Um, our goal is to do... Um, Four chapters each week starting we probably won't do a chapter on Monday because that's going to be the days that we um, like uh, delve into our new vocabulary and um, our grammar focus for the week but our goal is going to be to work towards reading one chapter um, each day um, as we read this chapter we want to be kind of mentally comparing the setting and the characters to the book we've already read this year called Frendel because that really is our standard. We are going to need to compare and contrast two books in the same genre. Uh, the genre here is realistic fiction. The genre in Frendel is also realistic fiction. Miracles on Maple Hill, Chapter 1. There's All Outdoors. Mother, say the scoot thing again, Marley said. She slid forward in the car seat, talking right against her mother's neck over her coat collar. Say it just the way your grandma said it. Marley, again, Mother asked. And please don't breathe down my neck, dear. She was driving, and the road was narrow and snowy and worrisome. Just say it once more, the way she said it. Marley noticed the look Mother gave Daddy, who sat beside her in the front seat. She could tell that Mother was afraid Daddy would object to hearing the same thing over and over. He was more tired than usual, even. When he asked Mother to drive, he was always as tired as he can be. Now he sat with his eyes closed and his chin buried in the collar of his jacket. But it was for him, really, that Marley wanted Mother to say the scoot thing again. Maybe they didn't think she knew why they were going to Maple Hill, but she did. Just once, I promise, Never to ask again, I promise, Marley said. Her brother Joe turned from the window for a change. The whole way up from Pittsburgh, he had kept his face glued to it like an old fly. Why don't you just say it to yourself, he asked. Mother said it ten hundred times. I want her to say it just once. If Joe asked her why she wanted Mother to say it, Marley couldn't have told him. The truth was that when Mother said those certain words, 
all the good feelings came back. Grandma's whole house and yard and her whole Maple Hill were in those words, just the way Mother had described them ever since Marley could remember. Grandma was in them too, the, with the way Mother said her voice was. Like a bird's voice if it pretended to be cross, but really wasn't. Mother was in them too, but in a special way. Not the way she was now, but the way she had been when she was Marley's age. Every summer she had come to visit her grandma at Maple Hill, right here in Pennsylvania's corner. How so many things could be in a few words was something else Marley didn't know. But it was the same way the whole feel of school can be in the sound of a bell ringing. Or the way the whole feeling of spring can be in one robin on a fence post. Daddy opened his eyes. You might as well say it, Lee, and get it over with, he said. He did not look at Mother or at Marley or at anybody. He liked to do the driving himself, especially when a road was as bad as this. But he was too tired. Soon after he had come home, while people were still marveling that he had come back at all after being a soldier and a prisoner and everything, Marley had heard him say to Mother, I think I'm going to be tired forever. But Mother had answered, Of course you won't. You know, Dale, I've been thinking. We could go up to that old place of Grandma's, Maple Hill. What you need is all outdoors for a while. Honestly, Marley, I don't see, Mother began. But she sighed. And then she said it. For a long time when Marley was little, she had corrected Mother every time any one of the words was the least bit different. So now Mother always said it exactly right. Every syllable, every other word had to come strong. As in a nursery rhyme. Now scoot, you two. For goodness sakes, up here, there's all outdoors. There. Marley sat back again. If there was all outdoors, there couldn't be very much indoors where all the trouble was. She could see the little old woman in a blue dress and a white apron with her broom in her hand. She was pretending to sweep the children out, as Mother said, because they kept hanging around the house after they arrived. The first time Mother told about it, a long time ago, Marley had asked, Why did you hang around? Why didn't you go outside and play? Mother laughed and said, <laughs> Grandma thought it was because we were too used to being pinned up in town. We were so used to having walls around us and ceilings over us that the sky and the country scared us to death. Grandma hated cities. We could hardly ever get her to come for a visit. She insisted that my brother and I come every summer out to Maple Hill. She told us the only place worth a grain of salt is where a child can go out and run as he pleases. Now, that is figurative language, worth a grain of salt. That is an idiom um, that means anything that's good. All outdoors. Marley stared out the window on her side as Joe did on his. Maybe she thought it wasn't just because of the city. She could remember times that had been nice there and happy before Daddy ever went away. And even while he was gone sometimes, Mother paid a lot of attention and 
They went to the museum on Sunday afternoons and to hear the Pittsburgh Symphony and for picnics in the park. Everybody felt sorry for Mother because Daddy was missing and nobody expected he would ever come back. But then he came. Now I'm going to stop right here and we're going to talk about where Daddy had been. In the previous page, it said that Daddy was a soldier and then a prisoner. Um, during several of the wars that the, this nation has participated in, specifically the Korean War, which would have been going on about the time that this was written, if United States soldiers were captured, they became prisoners of war. Unfortunately, prisoners of war were often tortured. Now, if you had been in class instead of um, having to listen to this audio version, you would have seen a slideshow that talks about what it was like to be a prisoner of war. And it talks about some other figurative language and vocabulary words that you'll find in chapter one. That slideshow will be available to you on Schoology if you want to look through it. But Daddy had been a prisoner of war and he had been tortured. Most prisoners of wars, most prisoners of war were not expected to ever return home. But right here it says, Daddy did come back. But when he came back, he had all of those horrific experiences of being a prisoner of war that he brought home with him. She wouldn't even think it was better before Daddy came back. Nobody must think such a terrible thing, but it was a worry. If a door slammed behind you, for instance, he'd shout, Who slammed that door? You'd start to tell him the wind made it slam, but there wasn't time. Mother always hurried in saying, Shh, shh, shh. Everything would be better in all outdoors. Mother expected it would be, and it would. Already things looked better. For two hours, the most wonderful outdoors, all hills and snow and big tall trees and farmhouses had been going past the windows. Once in a while, it was interrupted by a pretty little town and then it began again. Marley, Mother said anxiously, half turning her head but watching the road at the same time, you mustn't expect it to be exactly the way I said. Grandma's been gone from Maple Hill for nearly 20 years. Uncle John's lived here off and on, but, well, it's an old run-down place. Not like these lovely farms on the road at all. I know that, Marley said, but we're going to fix it up. Those were the words Mother used when Marley first heard them talking about it. Daddy had jumped the way he did sometimes and said, You mean it's going to fix me up. Now, this is a, um, that is um, a term, a, a type of figurative language. Daddy was thinking that... Um, Spending that time in the great outdoors would help him kind of release some of that mental angst of being a prisoner of war. And hopefully that would help him to recover some from the experiences that he had. Then, now we're going to read again. Dale, I didn't say that. Well, you meant it. Well, all right then, Mother had said, going red in the face. Why shouldn't we say it right out? I'm hoping it will. That had been just a little while ago during the Christmas holidays. You expected everything to be wonderful at Christmas time, 
and the town was wonderful with colored lights and decorated trees in every direction. Marvelous things were piled in every window along the streets downtown, and big organ music made the sidewalk sort of tremble. But this year, something had gone wrong with everything. Daddy didn't even come from his room Christmas morning to see the presents. Mother had explained, trying to smile. He was tired and hurt and not really cross. He was sick and discouraged, not angry at them or at anybody. There was a lot of difference, Mother said. Of course, it was true, but the house felt ugly and tight. Joe went off with his crowd right after breakfast. During the holidays, he found some place to go every day. Once, when they began to talk about coming to Maple Hill, Daddy had said, I don't know whether I can do it, Lee. All that wood to cut and everything. Do you think I can swing an axe anymore? Why, of course, Mother said. And Joe can help. He's 12, isn't he? That's just the age Grandma used to say kids stopped being a nuisance and started being useful. In two years, I'll be 12 too, Marley had thought. She was so interested in imagining the piles and piles of kindling she would cut that she forgot to listen to what Mother and Daddy said next. She was reaching up in her mind to put a piece of wood on a pile higher than her head. But then Mother said something so interesting and wonderful she couldn't help hearing it. When I was a little girl up at Grandma's, Mother said, I was certain that Maple Hill was the place where all the miracles had happened. Daddy didn't laugh. For a minute, as it was as if the two of them were holding their breath together. Then Daddy said, I'm afraid miracles don't happen anymore, even at Maple Hill. We'll go find out, Mother said. That was soon after Christmas. Now it was March, and here they were, going to find out. It's not very far from here, Mother said. Now, all outdoors seemed to be mostly trees close along the road. There were bare limbs that bent against the car, scraping as it passed, brushing off their snow. Hemlocks were like frosted green. Mother shifted gears and the car was a big black noise in the middle of a huge white quietness. Again, we have figurative language. What do you think she means by that term, the car was a big black noise in the middle of all that huge white quietness? Think about it, boys and girls. What does the world sound like when you walk out onto fresh snow and you're the only one out there making a sound? Isn't every sound magnified? Maybe that's what she meant. Back to reading. What a hill, Mother said. I'm not even sure this car's going to make it. They all leaned forward as if that might help somehow. The car was really struggling. I've heard stories about these spring roads, Mother said, pretending not to mind. But it was always summer when I came, and I never believed them. The car stood still. Then it's with it. Then, its wheels singing and whirling, Marley saw Daddy's face set hard, the way it always did when he was angry or upset. His cheeks sank in, and she could see his heart beating. I'm sorry, in his neck. Mother stepped on the gas, and the wheels sang still louder, and the engine roared like a truck. Shall I get out and push? Joe asked eagerly. That's all we need, Daddy said in an angry voice. Just Joe to get out and push. 
O's face went red. Daddy's was white. Mother roared the engine louder and louder. Stop it, Lee. You'll only spin the wheels, Daddy said. When the sound of the car died, silence was suddenly everywhere. It seemed coming and going in every direction, and they were in the middle of it. The front of the car tipped to upward on the bare beginning of the long hill. It can't be far to Chris's place now, Mother said. They can probably pull us out. People here are used to such things. We didn't even think to get chains, Daddy said. What farmers will be. Mother, Marley began, but Joe interrupted her. He said just what she had meant to say, except that he said I, and she had meant to say we. Mother, I'll get my boots and go on ahead and tell them, Joe said. I'll go too, Marley said. Joe looked at her in a superior way. You just slow me down, he said. That was the way he talked to her lately, even when it wasn't true. She never could say it wasn't true, though, because every time it made an argument and Daddy thought every argument was a fight and had to be stopped instantly. He said there was plenty of fighting going on in the world without them doing any of it. Mother hesitated. I, I don't know what else. She looked at Daddy. My boots are in the trunk, Joe said, and out he went. Mine are too. Get mine, Marley cried. He'll be sopping wet before he even gets his boots on, Mother said. Who would have thought there'd still be snow like this up here? Her voice was worried. Daddy didn't say one word. He just sat still, staring out of the windshield up the long hill. Mother, Daddy, can't I go too? Joe knows I can go as fast as he can. He knows I can, Marley cried. Hush now, Mother said. There's no use both of you catching your death a cold. Again, we've got figurative language here. What does that phrase, catching your death a cold, mean? We don't normally die from a cold, do we? Back to reading. Mother, we wouldn't. Don't argue, Marley. Please, Mother said. She gave Marley the look that said, Now, don't talk about it anymore or you'll worry Daddy again. Please, Marley. You heard what I said. But Mother Marley, don't argue. Daddy's voice was fierce. Joe scrambled back in the car with his boots and pulled them on, jamming his jeans inside. How important he acted. You would have thought he was the President of the United States or something. For a minute, Marley hated him. If he just said he'd like her to go along, she could. But if he would but he wouldn't say it for the world. She always said she'd like him to go along whenever she was going. And it was even true, but he'd never say it. Never, never, never. Please, Joe, she whispered so Daddy and Mother wouldn't hear. But Joe didn't seem to hear either. Mother said, Joe, you'll likely see the Chris place as soon as you get to the top of the hill. It's a big white house down a lane, green shutters. Behind it is a huge red barn. I'm pretty sure it's the next place. Her voice didn't sound sure at all. Just tell whoever is at the next place, Daddy said. I hope I'm right, Mother said. They're such wonderful people, and we're such good friends to Grandma and to John and me. Joe got out. He acted more important than ever, pulling his gloves right up over his sleeves. Marley said once more, Mother. But Mother looked at her hard. Joe started out turning to smile and wave. 
Marley hated him again, this time even more. But in a minute, he was walking alone up the hill, littler and littler, and the three sat silently watching him. By the time he got to the top of the hill, she loved him again and opened the door and hopped out on the running board to wave. He waved back. His hat looked very red and small, a dot on the white road against the sky. Now, the road was white because it was covered with snow. For heaven's sake, close the door. No use freezing us while we wait, Daddy said. But Marley hardly heard. I smell smoke, she said. Look, look right there. Only a little distance up the hill on the side where she stood was a wreath of blue smoke winding into the air. It looked lovely curling upward from the trees. Mother, may I go and see? May I? she cried. Mother and Daddy looked at each other. They both looked up the hill where Joe had disappeared. I can see a tiny little road. It turns in there. See, behind us. We didn't even notice it before. Can't do any harm, can it? While we're waiting, then she won't. Mother stopped. She almost said, then she won't be making a noise and fussing and be being in the way. Marley saw their look, saying, why not, and scrambled out for her own boots using the tramped places Joe had made. Now it was her turn to start out, to turn and wave from the little road to follow the deep ruts. Don't go far. Come right back, Mother called. It's got horse tracks, Marley cried back, and tractor tracks. Then the road turned into the trees. How beautiful, how beautiful. The land went up and down with snow everywhere, unbroken except where the little road wound through. But then there was another little road going into the trees and another. She stood still wondering. The tracks went around, over there and over there, in a big circle, and she stood staring. Every, every tree was hanging with bright buckets, and every bucket had a little pointed lid like a cap. Once she had seen a picture in a book at school. Then she heard somebody ahead chopping wood. The sound of the axe coming down was sharp and clear. And there he was, the wood chopper, swinging up and swinging down again. The sound of the axe hitting the wood reached Marley as he lifted it up again. He stood by an immense pile of wood. And behind the pile was a little brown house. It had a high brown smokestack that the blue smoke was pouring from and an extra little roof that seemed to be sitting on great billowing white clouds of steam. She glanced back toward the road. It was as if another step would bring the ordinary world completely to an end and this would be Wonderland. Even the sights and sounds did match here. Near her, a bucket hung against a tree. She distinctly heard a sound of drip, drip, drip. The man saw her as she came. He stopped chopping and lifted a hand to wave. He was smiling. Then suddenly he dropped the axe and began to walk toward her. She didn't know whether to go on walking herself or turn and run. But she went on walking and as he came closer, he cried. Suddenly, Lee, for goodness sakes, Lee. 
Hey! She could smell the smoke on his overalls when he held out his hand. He smelled wonderful, like a smoked ham. His face was round and red and fresh, and he was absolutely huge all over. His hand closed over hers, and his laugh was as big as he was in his huge blue jeans and sweater. Imagine me calling you, Lee, he said. You must be her girl, Marley. But you're your mother all over again. I'm Mr. Chris. Now, I want to stop here, and I want to point out two things. The sentence that says, he smelled wonderful like a smoked ham. That is figurative language. It is a simile. It's comparing two things using like or as. And in this uh, last paragraph, it said, but you're your mother all over again. I wonder if that means he sees her mother in her. Let's read on and see. Before she had time to say anything about the car or the hill or the trouble or anything else, he laughed and said, can you smell that, Marley? Did you get that whiff just then from the sugar house? I told my wife this morning, this time Lee's coming for the first breath of spring. She had got it. It was an absolute sweetness like a drift of a scent from a lilac bush, like passing an orchard in full bloom, but different, a different sweetness. Your great-grandma used to say there was all outdoors in that smell, Mr. Chris said. She called it the first miracle when the sap came up. She looked up at him in surprise. So that's where Mother had got the idea of the miracles. Where are your folks? At the house, he asked. In two minutes, they were on their way to the rescue. There were two big horses that he used to gather sap from trees on the steep hills where a tractor would go head over heels, he said. But the tractor was the thing to take that car home in a hurry. Marley sat beside him. The tractor was bright orange against the snow. She felt like a queen in a high chariot as they rolled off along the little road among the trees. So this is the end of chapter one. We want to talk a little bit about what we learned in this chapter. The name of the place we're going is Maple Hill. Now, I want you to think to yourself about what you know that contains the word maple that is sweet. I wonder if you are thinking of maple syrup. Because that's exactly what this first chapter is talking about. Again, in the um, slideshow presentation, we'll talk about maple trees. We'll talk about um, the sap running and how they tap the, the tree um, to collect the sap to turn it into maple syrup. 